What is up, ballers? Hit us up in the chat. Tell us where you're coming from. We got a very special show tonight. We're going to be talking about the Record Store Day Black Friday drops with our friend Jeremy. What's up, Jeremy Shatton from hey there. In Earful? How's it going? How are you? Um, good. And so um, we each chose three of these records to talk about. Um, do you have a record store that you prefer to go to for this, or do you hit a bunch of different ones, or how do you do your record store day? You know, I kind of go with the flow. I don't know where I'm going to be that day. If if I'm doing something else, I try to fit it in. Yeah. But obviously, in, in New York, I have my favorites. I like Rough Trade. Oh, yeah. Um, but some of the ones I like don't participate, like Record Grouch, Academy. You know, they usually sell mostly used stuff. Right, Rough Trade right. is probably the best store, at least in Manhattan, for new material. So that's the same store that um, is in England, right? Like they have the record label from? I don't know who, who owns what. It has the same name. We'll say that much. Okay, cool. All right. Which, and who do we have? Hold on. Let's look at the chat. Yeah. We got, oh, okay. We got Epsilon Omega 5 in the chat. What's up? Good evening, ballers. What's up, Nito? How's it going? And Corey Simons, the old crew is here. <laughs> um, all right, let's look at these records that we picked out. Yeah. Hold on a second here. I'm going to go to this view here. Whoops. And I'm going to remove that. <laughs> all right, there we go. All right, hold Let on a second see. here. Your first choice, Jeremy, is... Yes. My Jeez, first choice it, is Splinter. Splinter, yeah. Hold on a second. Let me find the slide. There it is. Yeah. Splinter, who were discovered by George Harrison, weren't they? That's correct. Splinter, The Place I Love is their album from 1974. They were George Harrison's first signing to his Dark Horse label. I actually have a copy of this that I got a few years ago for 10 bucks, which, according to Discogs, was overpaying, but I haven't seen it anywhere else. Now, the cool right. thing about this record is that George Harrison is all over it because of label obligations. He couldn't use his name. Right. And if you look on the, in the credits, it'll say things like Harry Georgeson or <laughs> P, yeah, P. Roducer or Jairaj Harrison. <laughs> nice. But using their real names are incredible musicians on here like Klaus Vorman, Mel Collins, Billy Preston. Oh, wow. Gary Wright. Just an incredible lush sound. And the thing I like about this record, beautiful vocal harmonies, is that it's it's a big dose of 70s goodness that has not been overplayed over the years. Do you get what I'm right. saying? Right, yeah. So it really sounds like that beautiful, warm 70s production. There's a little glam rock influence. and But it's not something you've heard a lot of. Yeah, I I I listened to it. I had not heard it. I I listened yeah. to the hit song, which is um, what's Coast it called? Pinetown. Yes, Coast and Tine Town, and it Coast sounds like Town, yeah. it sounds like George. It sounds like a George Harrison song almost. Well, I think he worked with them a lot on the songwriting. It actually took, I think, two to three years for them to make this record, because they sort of depended on him a bit. To get it over the finish line and he was busy doing other things mm -hmm. like going on tour and making his own records now one thing i will say is it sounds like they're doing a beautiful job with this reissue available for the first time since 1974 on vinyl so that's significant they yeah i mean parent vinyl they have reproduced the gatefold which looks like this i'm trying to uh, uh, hold in the right place but you get an idea. It's just a nice package. And yeah. one thing I don't know if they've reproduced is something that's really cool is that it came with this lyric sheet. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And also the inner sleeve is really neat because it's got the Dark Horse logo on it. Really oh, big. yeah. Yeah, you know, I love that. Fuzzy, but I think you get the idea. I yeah, feel very I know. lucky to have found this pristine copy of it a few years ago. And I really, really think it's fantastic that more people will enjoy this record in the way that George and the Splinter guys expected it to be enjoyed. Very really cool. Good. 
I'm just going to ask ballers in the comments. Can you tell me if you can hear the music and sound effects and stuff? Um, and if Jeremy's not like, I don't know, reverbing or something. And now we're going to go to my first one here, yeah. which is um, hold on a second. I have all, so much stuff going on here. My <laughs> first one is okay. The day law three feet high and rising box set. And now I put this as a thing. Um, I mean, I'm actually not probably going to pick this up <laughs> just because it's like 12, um, seven inches with 24 songs on it. And I mean, it's like, even like buddy, I think is split up into two different sides. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and I mean, it has a couple of cool things. You don't hear the music. Okay. Good to know. Um, yeah. So, but it has a cool, few cool things like, um, you know, it comes with a, a seven inch slip mat mm -hmm. and they look good. Now this, this sold out, um, like they, they did a, a tribe called quest version. Did you see that Jeremy, mm -hmm. when that came out for, um, low end theory? No, I, was, I was not aware. I was not aware. They did this a couple years ago. Same thing. They released the whole album as a box set of seven inches. Yeah. I mean, just and, to be devil's advocate, yeah. when it comes to the listening experience, I find these a little bit irritating because you just have to keep flipping. Yes, I agree. That's why I want They make beautiful objects. <laughs> right. It's an object. It's, it's a collectible object. It's kind of like yeah. those little teeny turntables that they sell with miniature singles. Um, yes. so, I mean, I, I selected this just because I thought it was a cool object, yeah. you know, and you, this I is mean, the... beautifully done. And yeah. I also think, you know, they have a lot to celebrate with their, all their stuff coming back to streaming this year. So exactly. this is kind of an ironic way to celebrate it with a, the most inconvenient way to listen to the album. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I love, it. Uh, you know, we, we know this is a fantastic record. And so it's cool. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that like people who are hardcore might want every version oh, of so. three, you know, um, he says so there's 3,500 of them. So that's pretty good. Yeah. There's 3,500 of them, which is not a lot. And actually this is like the, you know, they basically, this is the only image they've given so far. So mm. um, the fact that they don't, they didn't have a good, a good image. Cause this one's actually the real one. So you can actually see kind of that this is the actual box that one of the record yeah. stores got. Um, and it looks like it might be, you know, it's just, a, it's a weird picture. Um, but it was the only images I could find of it. I I'll actually be surprised if they can, if they do this in time for Jer for record store day, um, <laughs> it may not come out for everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. Whoa. All right, here, hold on a second. Let's go to your next one, mm -hmm. which is. Light in the Attic and Friends. Yeah, Light in the so Attic, in the being attic a, a label, is, right? You may be aware is, is a fantastic reissue label. I have a number of their prized reissues, including Michael Chapman. They brought him to my attention with their great reissues of Wrecked Again and other albums by him. Yeah. Betty Davis, I think they've done some of her things. So what they've done here is it's a bespoke collection celebrating years of light in the attic 22 years of light in the attic reissues what they've done is they've commissioned new recordings of songs they reissued by today's artists so you've got everything from iggy pop and the zigzags covering betty davis charles bradley covering rodriguez ethan and maya hawk covering willie nelson angel olsen singing a karen dalton song it just sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I also think the cover is great. It looks like it'll be a really nice object. It's a double album. It's pressed on special wax, colored wax, with a wide spine, wide spine jacket, booklet of new liner notes. I mean, it just looks like a really nice package. And I think Light in the Attic is just one of the best reissue labels around. And it's a nice opportunity to celebrate them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's cool. And they have very good resolution. I mean, very good uh, quality pressings and so forth as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Their stuff is fantastic. Um, and and, and Nito was asking if 45 RPMs is a better listening, like, 
experience do you think that you can can you hear the difference between like a high quality mm -hmm. 45 well, you know the, the idea is when you when you press say a 12 inch at 45 rpm like they did with the brian eno reissues a couple of years ago when yeah. you'd buy say another green world and it would be a double lp on 245 rpm yep you can get slightly deeper bass when you do that, you know, for example, Public Image Limited, their their metal box album was pressed to 45 RPM, three 12 inches with one or two songs on each side. You can have really wide grooves. And because it's spinning a little faster, I don't really know all the science behind it. But I think in general, you're not going to, it's not going to be like a drop, jaw dropping experience if you've got something on 45. And there's also the fact that, you know, that convenience factor we were talking about. If yeah. you get an album that was originally a single album, now it becomes a double album, and then you have to get up and flip it a lot more times. <laughs> yeah, like I have, um, I have a handful of them. Like I have the Mobile Fidelity kind of blue, um, which is yeah, yeah. forty five twelve. Now, uh, that's probably the best sounding record I own. Right. Um, you know, so it's it's incredible. It blew but my you also mind. Can't say if Mobile Fidelity put out one that was a single disc at thirty three. You can't really say whether or not it would sound any worse. Right. That's true. It might still be amazing. <laughs> exactly. All right. Okay. Let's go on to uh, my second pick, which is, um, whoa, which is this Bo Diddley. Oh, set, yeah. Which is four LPs. And it's, it's all of his chess records recordings from 1955 to 1958. It's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, it, and, and that's just peak, you know. I know a hand. I, I, part of it, the reason I want to get this is because I don't know all the songs. Mm. You know, I know, you know, maybe a half dozen or ten of them or something. You know, yeah. and um, and it's just, yeah, it's just. And Third Man does a great job with their reissues. This stuff um, is impeccable. Yeah, I have a Screaming Jay Hawkins record that they put yeah. out, and I Jack White really it. cares, and his team really cares about that stuff. Yeah, I also I would say one of the things about Bo Diddley that I think is underappreciated, and years and years ago, I got a CD that had his first two albums on one disc, and obviously there's the sound, there's the famous rhythm, but he was a terrific songwriter. I mean, songs like Before You Accuse Me, you can't even believe that it didn't just exist already. It's yeah. just such a perfect song. So, and, and uh, Who Do You Love? I mean, the lyrics to that song are ridiculous. Yeah. I don't think and, he gets a lot of credit as just a straight songwriter. And I mean, yeah, really, really good. so good. I mean, even like, you know, the title track, obviously, is like... Oh, oh man, yeah. It is, is incredible. And yeah, an amazing statement for the time, but also just like you said it's one of those songs that it seems like it la it existed forever and he just exactly. pl plucked it out of the ether he was also so specific about his sounds he he would re-engineer a lot of his guitars and do stuff like that and i think also just you know having jerome the guy on the maracas mm -hmm. added a special touch and he often worked with female guitarists and bass players I don't know how he found them because they they weren't on any other but anybody else's records, but it's just so good at that time. He could do no wrong. Nito visited Bo Diddley's grave in Florida. Oh, um, wow. it's, a, it's a what was the monument? I've never. I don't even think I've seen a photo. He was of it was buried in Florida, huh? Yeah, I guess, and he says it was a cool monument, so that makes yeah, that me wonder. Really um. Yeah, hey, go, what's go, up? Go. We got Georgia Constitution Media in the house. What's up, Georgia Constitution Media? Nice. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, and um, yeah, he was rock and roll royalty in Gainesville, Florida, says Nito. Oh, that's interesting. Is that where he'd he... be rock and roll royalty in New York City? <laughs> yeah, he's just rock and roll royalty. I love, I love Bo Diddley. All right, let's move on to your next one. Yeah. Which is um Graham Parsons. This actually sounds incredible. I think of, of all the three of the, th obviously I don't need the Splinter album again. This one I really would like to have. 
it's 7,500. So that's not, that's not very few. And it's being pressed by Amoeba Records, the store in LA. This tape yeah. has been in their possession for years. It got kind of buried in their storage for a while. Then they brought it out. So it started with a soundboard cassette because one of the guys in the band was asked, you know, felt that they were really hitting their stride. So he asked the sound man to make him a cassette of this night. It was 1973. So 50 years ago. And you've got Graham Parsons, Emmy Lou Harris, and the band on here. This is the first live Graham Parsons solo album ever released officially. It's the wow. first Graham solo material release in 40 years. This is huge. If you're not a fan of Graham Parsons, I suggest you go back, listen to the Flying Burrito Brothers, plus his two albums, Grievous, Angel, and GP. Wonderful mm -hmm. albums. He sort of also introduced Emmylou Harris to the world because he had her singing harmony. If you've oh, heard wow. Bob Dylan's Desire, she does the same thing on there. And well, Graham Parsons got there first, so Dylan can't always be first. <laughs> He's kind of underrated, huh? He's usually underrated. And then there's also the Rolling Stones connection. Some people say that he wrote Wild Horses, or at least Cole wrote it. It appeared on a Flying Burrito Brothers album before it was on a Stones album, I believe. Wow. And he and Keith Richards were running buddies for quite a while. He helped Keith Richards sort of get into the Americana sounds that you heard on Sticky Fingers, Exile on Main Street. He was hanging on there. I don't think he ever got a credited appearance or songwriting credit on any Rolling Stones album, but he was a key to those, you know, 69, 72 Stones albums. Well, which, uh, but that's like the peak. That's, that's just icing on the cake. He was a terrific songwriter. Oh, and of course he was in The Birds, and helped make Sweetheart of the Rodeo, which some people say invented country rock. So, oh man, I love huge. that album. Yeah, I love that album. Yeah, he was in the Birds for a brief period. Really interesting character. Unfortunately, died very young, a long time ago. So his influence sort of comes and goes. I really look forward to hearing this. He has like there's this song called "We'll Sweep, Sweep Out the Ashes," absolutely incredible song. The new so, soft shoe is another great one they have on here. So have you heard this recording? No, no, it's never come up in any of my, you know, bootleg searches or downloads. It said, I mean, it literally says here that the pedal steel player saved the cassette for 40 years and then he sold it to Amoeba for something. Wow. And then it disappeared for 10 years. They, they lost track of it. <laughs> That's so nobody crazy. has heard this. And they so does Amoeba have a good uh, pressing? Like I haven't ever heard of. I have no records. idea. I didn't know they actually released records. So maybe they're starting. And ballers, to be too. honest. And they they actually did one of their uh, "What's in Your Bag" videos with Dennis Ball, which came out this week. So check that out. Is that right? Um, yeah. Well, you know, yes, yes. Wink, <laughs> wink. Nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, by the way, Sweetheart of the Rodeo by the Birds Ballers. There's a song called You Ain't Going Nowhere on that Oh, record, yeah, that's a Dylan song. Which is, uh, yeah, Dylan's, which is incredible. Um, That's like a great version. Oh, yeah. I, I love, okay, all right, let's move on to. Oh, and I will just mention that according yeah. to the website here, this comes with a Graham Parsons poster. And he was quite an attractive man, so. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and and the, the 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 de la seven inch thing comes with a seven inch square poster. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a poster or more like a flyer? I don't know. It's a fly. I know it's well, not. This one's I mean, only eleven by seventeen. You know, I was looking at a, a P Funk album I have today, and it that one has a twenty two by forty eight inch poster. Like what <laughs> what album is that? Live P Funk Earth Tour. Oh, okay, interesting. All right, cool. Um, Coming soon right. to a video near you. I'm, I'm making a video about live albums. Oh, cool. <laughs> I would love it if they, um, if Funkadelic did, you know, George Clinton did some P-Funk and Funkadelic re-releases for Record Store Day with some. Yeah, with their, their catalog extra. is a mess. The, the, the other, I was at a record fair and I came across a copy of 
uh, what's that one? Uh, it slips my mind, but one of the classics from like 1974 with the yeah. Pedro Bell cover. I pulled the record out. It was completely trashed. I was so oh. upset. I thought I was going to get a copy of this thing for five bucks. They usually go for about seventy-five dollars. Yeah, yeah, fine. And I, uh, one of my grails before we move on is um, um, one nation under a groove. That was which, that. That was the one, actually. Yeah, because it and it has a seven-inch. So is it like two LPs and a seven-inch or something? It comes with it, the original version. This this had nothing extra in it, but it was totally trashed. I could not, I could not buy it. Yeah, like that version, the original version actually came with a, a seven inch. Well, in that's the thing. The All their records had like goodies in them. Yeah, the live album not only did it have the poster, it also had an iron-on transfer. <laughs> See, those are the things, you know. Um, and if and you I go it for three ninety nine, <laughs> if you go to the. Um, Museum of African American Music Music in Nashville. Oh. They have they have a giant One Nation Under a Groove flag hanging over the overhead oh when you go in. I don't know. That's it must cool. be it's so big that it must be stage used, a stage hmm. one, you know. Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, and let's see. The is owned by the the uh, Smithsonian. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Oh, yeah, the mothership is owned by the Smithsonian. Exactly. There's also a anyway, whole. We have digressed. What was your? Yeah, third pick? yeah. My third pick is our good friend David J. It was releasing a, a three LP set, which is wow. literally tracks from the attic. Meaning he found a, he has like a bunch of cassettes from just recording stuff at his house. A lot of it's acoustic mm. guitar. Um, there's a few like studio kind of things in there. Everything here is unheard except for one song, which was, you know, released as a bonus or, or a B side or something. Wow. But it's all unheard and it's supposed to be great. I mean, he's an amazing songwriter, you know, and is this all solo material or are there other people involved? Uh, it's mostly solo. I'm, hmm. I'm guessing that there's probably, he probably has a few people in there. But they're basically saying it's him with a candle and acoustic guitar. Um, Incredible. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. And as ballers, of course, you know him from Bauhaus and Love and Rockets. And he wrote uh, Bella Lugosi's Dead on his bike on the way home <laughs> from a factory job, which um, which you can hear him talk about in the interview we did with him. So, like, very. Uh, I had to. Yeah. I had to point. Like, it just looks such like such a cool set and. Um, I'm really curious. He's such an interesting artist who's gone all over the map. It would just be interesting to see, like, what he copies, did. man. You gotta, you gotta jump on that one. If yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'd hate to have to beg him for a copy because I think he would probably ignore me. <laughs> 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 all right, hold on a second. So that said, um, um, that's our. Those are our picks for record store day. Yeah. Um, and ballers, if what you have, are you, are you going out? Do you have a place in, in Atlanta? You, that you you, I do. Um, yeah, I will review it for you, Nito, if I can get a copy of it. Mm. I, I, I usually go to a place called fantasy land records in mm. Atlanta. And I actually ran into the owner of that shop at the Morrissey show the other day. <laughs> and, and, a, and a youngster came up and was like, Oh dude, you have a record store. Oh, I, you know, a criminal records. And I was like, I said to the kid, listen, He's not a kid. He was probably 25. I said, listen, kid, criminal records is like a it, that's entry level. Fantasy mm. land is an advanced record store, <laughs> meaning there's tons of used stuff. And he has a whole big room in the back. That's just jazz, like used jazz records. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, there's some great stuff in there. And I, I, I always hope that I will run into a mod Jamal down here he bops around town and goes into there sometimes oh is that right, um, right. yeah he's a he's an npr but guy he down here he, he hosts a, a jazz show on the radio uh but he's in town i had no idea yeah i tried to get him on the show but he's not interested in being on dennis ball's show apparently <laughs> <laughs> but, his, loss, his loss i tell his you. loss i guess <laughs> but ballers thanks for joining us um let, let's see any of you guys gonna pick any of these up or do you have anything? Say in the chat if there's something you want to pick up. Um, and we will, 
uh, it'll take a minute for them to get that message. But were there any other ones, Jeremy, that you were looking at that you were thinking about getting? Well, there is the Asteroid City soundtrack. It's a oh, really yeah. enjoyable collection. You know, I love the movie. I think it's really one of Wes Anderson's best. And, and it's a lot a, of old country and stuff, right? Yeah, a lot of old country. And then they mix that in with the soundtrack, you know, the, from the score, selection from the score. And I'm sure the package is beautiful. There's also a reggae collection, uh, one of those soul jazz things. Yeah, been those are great. For like eight years. The Studio One Kings, it's called. A lot of that mm -hmm. stuff is very rare and hard to find. Even if you go on Spotify, you can find the album there, but it's all grayed out. So I don't know what country where you can play it, but not here. So interesting. I certainly would not mind getting a copy of that. <laughs> yep. And then there was one other one that I noticed, which was, um, well, there were a few, but one that jumped out to me was The Doors. Um, there's like a two-disc Doors live record. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which... It's like really, it's sort of, they're saying it's like a, it's like a, a surreal, it's like a expansive, surreal, like <laughs> journey that you go on with them. So they long jams on some of the songs. Yeah. I've um, got some, uh, yeah, I've got some great Doors bootlegs. They can really go off. <laughs> yeah. So it made me wonder, like, it, it, do you think it would be good? It'll be good. Or like I got their Paris blues record and I was a little disappointed at record store day a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they can be variable. I, I have, I have one bootleg called rock and roll is dead where they do this very long song that it sounds like they're making up on the spot. And it's just Jim Morrison going rock and roll is dead. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you know, when, when it's a bootleg, you sort of don't care in a way you're like into it because it shows yeah. you another side of the artist. But if you right. spent like $50 and you got that, maybe you'd be a little bit like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's something but about, I, I do, I do love the doors and, and I would be interested in hearing anything they, they dig up. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Nito's interested in Flaming Li Lips, Yoshimi Live 2002, the Boston show, where they put on a that record. That could kill. They yeah, totally. Crazy. And Punk Goes Christmas, I thought that was kind of interesting. But then I looked at it and I only, uh, you know, I only recognized like Newfound Glory. It was like new bands that I wasn't familiar with. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would I would check it out before I um, played it. And guys, yeah. Chuckle Balls... Um, Oh, Nito has a bootleg CD of the Door Show. It's pretty good. Huh. Um, okay. Wonder if the quality you can find it on YouTube. Thank you, Nito. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if the quality would be improved. I would hope they would master it. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, sure and, they'll do they'll do what they can with it. And it looks like it's well. There's going to be a lot of those seventy five hundred, and then on CD twelve thousand five hundred. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so exactly. this is from 1970. Oh, you know what? I think I actually have this bootleg too. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, really? This is good. This is a good one. Oh, the Yoshimi one? No, no, no. The Doors. I have this Bakersfield concert. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is good. It's a good I'm, show. And, uh, you know, these... in 1970, they could really be all over the place. So it's a good one. Oh, I'll check it out. I'm, uh, yeah, the Bakersfield one. Guys, yeah. I don't. I didn't pre prep for Chuckle Balls tonight because, like, <laughs> I haven't. The show has kind of moved away from that um, to be just about records. Um, I know that you guys love it, and I enjoyed doing it. But, like, believe it or not, it was a lot of work to pull that together every week. <laughs> um, and so I, oh, I you know, uh, you know, so that's the show's kind of like transformed a little bit. Now I made there is a channel called Live at Chuckle Balls. Um, which is just like chuckle ball segments from past shows. And, you know, if you guys subscribe to that and if you want me to do that, then sub to it. And, you know, maybe I'll like start doing like just such chuckle ball segments once in a while on mm. that. But it would probably be a different, different channel. Um, yeah. Cause I basically found that doing both things was not like serving the growth of the channel very well. And, I was actually kind of right. Like when I stopped doing that and started making documentaries, the channel blew up mm. or at least blew up more than it was. So sorry, ballers. Um, 
I appreciate you guys being uh, here for our Friday night hangout. Happy yeah. Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Jeremy, have a great weekend. You too. And, um, Signing and off. We'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great one. Peace out. Hold on. I have to go, right. to, our, go to our goodbye music. I'm guessing they can't even hear the music, probably. Sorry, guys. When you walk in, that's just a lamp. That is love. You can see Possum Kingdom Ramblers uh, play live pretty regularly. They're going to be at a video game convention in Texas this weekend.